Good afternoon and greetings from Lausanne, Switzerland. I'm Damien Hodari, Professor of Strategic Management at the Ecole Hotelière de Lausanne. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are in the world. And thank you, thank you for joining us. My name is Anita Menderotta, and I'm a strategic advisor and consultant of a tourism and development firm under my name. I'm also very blessed to be the special advisor of the Secretary General of the UNWTO. We are incredibly grateful that you are here with us today. I think we should begin by first explaining what this show is all about. And the best way we think to do it is to explain what it's not. It's not a lecture, it's not a class, it's definitely not a news show. We want this to be a conversation, not only a conversation between Anita and myself and with our guests every week, but also with you, the students, graduates, job speakers, and other people who are passionate about the industry. Our goal is to have a place where we can talk and, and question, perhaps probably not even answer the questions, but at least raise them and discuss them and learn from each other every week how we can best deal with this crisis that we're facing and with the recovery that hopefully we're all going to help initiate. So why did we come up with this idea? What was the whole point of RISE? Ultimately, it's all about uncertainty. It's about these incredibly uncertain times in which we are all living, not just trying to work, which means it's all about COVID-19. COVID-19 is an international crisis that none of us in the world have ever faced before in our generation. It's global, it's invisible, and it's unforgiving. It is hitting countries and people across the world. As a result, it is doing so in a way that has us all fearful. All of us are facing uncertainty. All of us are fearful for our health. But on top of that, we're fearful for our personal finances. We're fearful for our jobs. We're fearful for our futures. And we're fearful for our families and the people that we love. We needed to bring a way of finding the eye of the storm. How do we make sense of this, especially for all of you, the people who've invested so much time and their minds and their hearts into the future leadership of tour tourism, travel, and hospitality? What about you and your futures? So Damien and I, who've known each other through the EHL connection, thought, how do we find a place where we can simply come together and ask the questions? Importantly, how do we not waste these 100 days? How do we use them so that all of us can prepare for the future that's ahead of us? That's what we're trying to achieve. Before we go any further, I just want to take a second and firstly thank EHL. It is an enormous honor and pleasure for my business and my team to be working with you on this initiative. We are incredibly honored to do so. I also extend the warm regards and congratulations from my Secretary General, my other boss from the UNWTO, who is thrilled to hear that we have almost 400 people initially registered, we expect the number to go higher, for our first program itself. So we ask you all to sit back, enjoy it. This is for you, with you, and we really want to make sure that this time is what you need to have confidence to move forward. I now pass it back to Damien to explain why this subject for this first week. Yes, and as the subject, as you can see, is called work in progress, because we believe that not only is this show a work in progress, the industry's recovery is a work in progress, a slow but important one, and your careers are and actually always will be works in progress. And so as we work through the issues that are facing all of us and our firms, our industries and our, and our own careers, we want it to be something that we can work forward together with you week by week. So today is a work in progress. We do, as we said, want this to be a conversation. You have a Q&A button there at the bottom of your screen. Please do send us questions. We want to answer them later in the episode to make sure that we are addressing the, the questions and concerns that you have. We expect this show to last just under an hour, a little depending on how many questions we're able to answer. So hopefully uh, we'll see you there at the end as well as here at the beginning. Excellent, so let's get to it. As Damien said, this is not about classes, this is not about exams, this is not a lecture. Let's get a sense of what in the world is going on. To do that, we literally wanted to start with some context because ultimately what we know is that we need to move to understanding what in the world is going on. Critical to this is separating the news from the noise. 
as COVID-19 started to spread from the East to the West, all of this information and intelligence, but also opinion started to bubble out. So how do we separate that? What we have done, and we promise you, this is the only section in the entire program that's gonna be focusing on stats, is find just a handful of statistics that we use as key indicators. We're going to keep tracking these on a regular basis, simply so we can understand, again, what in the world is going on? What does it mean for our industry? And importantly, what does it mean for you? So let's start at the beginning, which is ultimately, as I said earlier, it's all about COVID-19. Now, what I find the most valuable resource in terms of understanding what in the world is happening with this virus is the World Health Organization. They are critical. They have a fantastic dashboard to get a sense of where is it in the world in terms of cases and how is it spreading. This is my go-to, strongly, strongly recommend it. This is the one I would encourage you to look at in terms of, okay, where is the virus now and where is it moving on to or moving out from? The question from there, however, is how are governments responding? And that's where I think it gets very interesting. And I'm going to pass it to Damien to explain why. We're using the Oxford Government Response Tracker uh, statistics, which you can also find online. And what they are doing is tracking 12 indicators about the strictness that governments are taking in order to restrict the free movement of people and goods in their, in their countries in order to reduce the spread of the virus. For example, if you look at the indicators for China, you would notice that in the early January, they already began a quick um, implementation of a lot of measures. And these measures include everything from school closing to workplace closings, canceling public events, closing public transportation, restrictions on internal movement, et cetera. And they kept those pretty steady for a couple of months until they started to notice apparently a reduction in the spread of the virus. And they've been slowly decreasing the implementation and, and, and relaxing standards. On the other hand, Italy, which started a little bit later, quickly ramped up even more strict measures than China, and they're still maintaining those, although there's signs that that will begin to diminish. And if we look at a third example, um, Sweden, they started policies much later than almost anybody else and have initiated much fewer measures, uh, restrictions than, than other countries. The most important thing for us here is that the lines going up, the increase in measures to restrict um, free movement of people to reduce the virus was very unpredictable and uncertain. But you can be certain that the downward line, how quickly and how easily and the success at which the relaxing of these measures take place will be as uncertain, if not more. And that's something we definitely want to keep an eye on, because as those measures are relaxed, we should start to see some more economic activity and hopefully the beginning of the of the recovery of our industry. Brilliant. Now, Demian said something interesting a couple of times, which was the restriction of free movement. Now, what's important there is it's not just the restriction of people. It's also the restriction of goods and services, because ultimately the GDP is the measure of the economic activity and the value of a country within a certain period of time. What we are finding is that with schools closed, with borders closed, with airlines grounded, the ability for manufacturing to turn into trade is dramatically hit. So this indicator from the World Trade Organization of global GDP growth is very important. It's important for a couple of reasons. A, it shows how dramatically the value of GDP or the level has dropped as a result of what's happening with COVID-19. But also importantly, you can see the difference between the March and the April forecast. That is an indication directly of exactly as Damien says, the level of uncertainty. The level of uncertainty and how to read this is not just the degree to which trade and travel is being restricted, but importantly, how long we predict this crisis to be taking place. Because we know this crisis is in its first wave. Many countries around the world, particularly in Asia, as they started ultimately experiencing the crisis first, are experiencing a second wave. A second wave is what's going to hit us, which means the life cycle of this virus will go longer and longer. The longer and longer it goes, the less trade, the less operations, the less employment in terms of people working there's going to be, which means the less economic activity. This is a really important indicator, which has a direct impact then on how, where, and when we're going to be a working world again. 
We then carry on into, okay, we're talking about the working world. What does it mean for our industry? When we talk about travel, tourism, and hospitality, how do we translate the virus, the way governments are reacting, and GDP impact to our industry? And now we're going to shift to the United Nations World Tourism Organization to look at what the UNWTO sees as the travel and tourism indicators. This was a slide that I, from the travel and tourism side and representing the UNWTO, was always very excited about because it showed that for the last 10 years, we have had incremental growth over and over and over because the world has wanted to travel. And with it traveling, we're connecting people, we're connecting places, and we're connecting value and supply chains. But then came COVID-19. And we are seeing a more dramatic plunge in travel and tourism than we ever have in the last century. That's what's very scary about this. The impact of this is going to be, we anticipate, between 20 and 30% drop in travel and tourism. As like with GDP, it's not just the drop in travel activity, it's how long it takes to get people traveling again. Because suddenly, for so many people in the world under lockdown, from Asia all the way to Americas, the ability to have confidence, confidence again in going outside it's not just about opening doors, borders, and skies. It's about opening up peace of mind. This then takes us, as we say, to the critical lever of opening up the world, which is aviation. And we have an indicator here from ICAO, which is the UN body for civil aviation. And it shows in April the change in passenger capacity around the world. Why are we showing you this? Three reasons. Firstly, it shows you how dramatically countries linked to what Damien said earlier about government response stopped flying commercially. Why are these not 100%? Simple, because a number of carriers are still being utilized for emergency response. Medical aid, medical protection people, and products need to be carried around the world. But then you look at this for the third reason. The United States, China, the UAE, Hong Kong, for example, they're just not destinations people are traveling to, they're travel hubs. So if someone wants to go from, technically, from Toronto all the way to Cape Town, they might choose to go via the UAE, via Dubai, and connect to take Emirates down. These hub destinations, when they shut down, the world is not able to go from A to B because C is not able to accept the carrier going in and out. This is a really important part of how we see our industry affected because without aviation, we don't have travel, we don't have tourism, and clearly hospitality is hit because aviation is the primary artery of globalization, whether it's passengers or it's the trade and manufacturing in the belly of the planes. I'm gonna hand over to Demian now to look at what's our next indicator. So clearly, if people aren't traveling and if people aren't flying, they're not going to be staying in hotels nearly as they did before. The, the most recent figure we have from STR is that occupancy in Europe for the week ending April 11th was only 8%. That's roughly 60 to 70% less than the year before. We saw something similar in the States where occupancy is 20%, which sounds incredible compared to 8%, but was still a 70% drop from the year before. It's important to look at this figure, not only to understand that nobody's staying in hotels, but this is a quick indicator that's real time. You can check this every day or every week, and STR is great about reporting these numbers, and thus we'll be able to track whether the hotel industry is starting to recover to a certain degree by watching how this figure hopefully increases in, in the short term, probably more in the long term, but we'll keep an eye on that number. And obviously, if nobody's traveling, if nobody's flying and nobody's staying in hotel, there aren't enough jobs for people. And we can see that the WTTC has forecasted 75 million jobs will be lost due to COVID-19 in the travel, tourism, and hospitality industries. The IATA is forecasting 25 million lost jobs in aviation. We saw in March that 60% of people who applied for unemployment in the United States, 60% of them came from only restaurants and bars. And the American Hotel and Lodging Association is forecasting that 50% of people that work in hotels in the United States are going to lose their job. That's 4 million people. 
And we cite these numbers again, one, because we want to track these over time to see what's actually happening with unemployment so we can help you understand what the implications are for your career. But secondly, because they are a immediate indicator of what's happening in the industry that we can track to learn from and understand what measures are being taken that are improving the, the situation. As Jan Freitag said in his webinar um, from STR last week, it seems that every week he is saying that we are, we've seen the largest rev par, revenue per available room in hotels, decrease in history. And he's saying that every week because things are getting worse every week. Let's see when that starts to plateau and starts to tick back up. So what we also thought we would do on this show is not just look at data. And in fact, that's the, all the data we're going to look at today, but to look more qualitatively at what's happening in the industry. And what we thought we would do for this is both Anita and I have picked three headlines independently that struck us during this time. What's happening in the news? What are we reading about that we think is important and that we wanted to share with you? And I'm going to go first. So my first headline says, hotel sector will rebound strongly, says research. And this is just from two days ago. That sounds fantastic. However, my real headline is this. There are numerous other headlines from the same week saying the completely opposite thing. There are headlines saying that this virus was not going to be important. Other ones saying it was going to be the end of the world. Other ones saying that industry is going to recover quickly. <coughs> Excuse me. And other ones that the industry is never going to recover. The point being, there is an intense amount of uncertainty, as Anita mentioned before. And that's the point of my first headline. Nobody knows what's happening let alone what's going to happen, nor how will firms respond to the, the actions that are, the, what's happening in the world around us. So we have multiple layers of uncertainty. And if business leaders and countries are uncertain about what to do, it's absolutely normal that we and you are also uncertain about what we need to do. Over to you. My second headline is the fact that economic pain is going to persist long after lockdowns end. And that's from the New York Times from April 13th. The point here is, not, is to not confuse the end of lockdown, the end of restriction of movement with the end of the crisis. The crisis has really just begun and it's going to last a long time for our industry. A couple of things. Research has found that restaurants, reservations were already decreasing before lockdowns took place. People were already afraid to go out, even if the country, the governments didn't tell them they couldn't go out. Other research has found that 70% of people would not attend a sporting event until there's a vaccine. And a different study found that 70% of people wouldn't go to a theme park or movie, even if they were allowed to do so right now. The governor of California has said that when he re re relaxes standards and allows restaurants to open again, it's not gonna be like it was before. You should expect your waiters to be wearing uh, masks and gloves and using disposable menus. Emirates Airline just initiated 10 minute blood tests at the check-in in Dubai before allowing people to board the plane. So the point here is not just that there's going to be long-term pain for all of us, but what is the industry going to do and what will it be like and what will jobs be like going forward? My third headline is not quite a headline. It's two announcements similar from Marriott and Airbnb. And they've both launched these virtual experiences um, that allow you to visit a destination virtually from, from your own home. The reason I chose this was because it gives us a little confidence that these firms that have been very successful in that great last 10 years that the industry has been thriving are not just sitting back and doing nothing and crossing their fingers and waiting for things to change. They're trying to initiate new strategic choices. They're trying to make decisions that they think will A, satisfy those customers and keep them loyal to their brands now, but also hopefully provide the, the, the firms with new revenue sources or new ways to penetrate markets, new ways to give experiences to people. I'm not sure these will work. And that's the second point of pr providing these. What, the decisions that we make now, that firms make now to deal with the virus will have long lasting implications for the success of these companies going forward and for what the industry is like in the future. 
And so I would keep a close eye on all these measures that companies are taking to try to stay relevant and differentiated during this crisis. I must say, I always love working with you, Damien, because you remind me that it's not that some people see the world with the cup half full versus half empty. There are also those that see it and had, like myself, the cup runneth over. And there are those, I think, like yourself, that kind of kick the cup over. That's the fun part of having this conversation with you, because there's always different perspectives. I love that you chose this, because this, whether it's Airbnb, the hotel companies, or even destinations and airlines now, this is a really critical part of the truisms of COVID-19. Our world is about travel. Our world has seen growth of travel because people love exploring, they love discovering, and they want to keep dreaming about where next. The good thing is that hotels, destinations, airlines, attractions are recognized just because people can't travel and their passports are put away. It doesn't mean their dreams are put away. So in the conversion process where people get the, they go through the dreaming phase, then the research, then the booking, the conversion phase, then the actual experience, and then the bragging phase, all that's happening now is the dreaming phase is getting longer because people and destinations are recognizing like hotels, people can still dream through their computers while they're locked up. And once they can go out again, they know exactly where they're going to go. And this is where different companies are trying to keep close to remembering, ultimately, we're all human and we all want to get out again. So follow Airbnb, follow Marriott and the directions they're taking us in the world. This now moves to my headlines. My first headline is focusing very much on travel and tourism per se. And a headline that really struck me with Australia turning around and saying there might be a travel ban of international travel until 2021. That could be an institutionalized end to international travel, which last year in 2019 was 10 million international arrivals representing one in eight jobs in Australia. That is the government basically saying, for the sake of your health and our stability as a nation, we want you to stay at home and travel. Incredibly important. If you think of how that impacts airlines, DMOs, the destination marketing organizations and national tourism organizations, hotels, attractions, all of this. It's basically saying, if we're going to have no international travelers, how do we maximize the amount of travel by using Australians within their own country, maximizing the opportunity of domestic travel so travel can continue to build the country? My next headline, which I thought was fascinating, similarly about 2021, was Los Angeles mayor saying that there's probably not going to be any large gatherings, concerts, or sporting events until 2021. So if you and your daughter can't go off to see Taylor Swift, why is this such a big deal? You might be quite pleased by this because you're not quite happy to be in a stadium of 30,000 screaming teenagers listening to Taylor Swift, but that's not the point. When you go with your daughter, you might be flying to the destination, you stay in a hotel, you have food and beverage requirements, you then go to the concert, so there's ticketing, you've got ushers at the concert, there's merchandise, there are probably 10 different links and that entire experience chain, which will mean employment that's going to stop. So when these events stop, the entire experience around it stops. And that to me was quite devastating. However, we still need to look for how do we keep hope? And that's why we really wanted RISE to be created. What can we look to, to keep holding on to say, wait a minute, some good will come from this. It might come later, it will come later, but it also comes now. And that's why my third headline, because you gave me permission to get a warm and fuzzy one. So this is my warm and fuzzy. This was fantastic to see that a European airline whose, whose basically attendants had to be laid off were applied then to the healthcare system to help with the patients around the coronavirus. This is magic. Because what it says is that in the hospitality sector, in travel and tourism, not only do our students, our graduates, or people in working have exceptional expertise in the technical skills, they also have the soft skills. The ability to connect with people, whether they're healthy or not, whether they're afraid or not, and get them through an experience. We know this at 35,000 feet and now at ground level. But this is not just about during COVID-19. 
our industry has always been a poaching ground, for lack of better words, of people, companies, industries that want those soft skills. So that's really important. This I loved. So this was a good bridge, but I snuck in one. Sorry, Damien, I broke your rules because I thought if I look at this time and wait, look up and say, okay, you said three, but I'm gonna sneak in one more, only because I know ultimately you're a romantic at heart. Mm. What I wanted to do was put in, if I look back at this time, if we all look back at this time a year from now, what are we gonna remember? What was the one moment of, oh my goodness, this is real and this is hitting everyone. For some people it's toilet paper wars, I know that's your signature, but mine's the next one. And I snuck in a little video of a KLM flying attendant, flight attendant who was going to be flying her last flight because she knew that ultimately aviation was being grounded. So when we go to the next slide, I think, Damien, looking at this, I think we need to change our music, and this should be the theme song of Rise. Okay, let's hear it. Dear passengers, in this difficult time, I would like to say goodbye to you in a different way. We are, this flight crew, uh, rather emotional of what is going to happen with KLM also and with everything. We have a blue heart and we do not know when to show this again to you. Nowadays music brings us together and that's why I will sing a song to you to say goodbye. And wish you all the best and love and stay healthy from us, KLM crew. So, this is for you. When will I see you again? When will we share precious moments? Will I have to wait forever? Will I have to suffer and cry the whole night through? When will I see you again? When will our hearts be together? Are we in love or just friends? Is this the beginning or is this the end? When will I see you again? When will I see you again? Thank you very much. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you feel comfortable to surprise me with things like this. Um, heartwarming, and we need more of that. So I'm not someone who doesn't want to see stories of faith and, and, and such. And what I like is that I do think our industry has answered the call. You know, restaurants delivering food for free to healthcare workers, hotels providing rooms, um, uh, people just applauding for you know for for all the people that are that are doing what they can to help save people um you said before that i sort of kicked the glass over and, and maybe i am a, more skeptical these stories are great and uh, i just worry that there aren't enough of them and that they're not creating jobs and they're not going to necessarily change what happens but if they give people a positive image of the industry that we all love because it is a wonderful industry and we are answering the call. I think that's the, the real benefit from these kind of stories and, and videos. So you're welcome to share another video next week if you want. I'm, I've, I have hundreds of witnesses that have heard you say that. So I'm gonna take that call. All right, um, if I can move us on a little bit now. Uh, we now turn to the segment of the show that Anita and I, I think we were both most excited about um, as we start to create this show. We're happy to talk to you and with you, but we also wanna bring on um, executives and other experts from the industry to really help us and you learn about the approach that different firms are taking, what are strategists thinking about this, and how should they and you respond to the current crisis. And I'm going to let Anita introduce our first ever executive in residence on this show. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Damien. And exactly as he said, this is one of our most exciting segments for us because it's a matter of getting real leaders from around the world to give their perspectives, but not just perspectives as business leaders, but as people. 
How are they making sense of all that is just so uncertain? So when we looked at this, we thought it's not about businesses. It's not about their business cards. It's not about their egos. It's not about their PR. It's about them as genuine leaders making sense, as we said, of the uncertain. So when we were deciding who do we bring to the stage, the virtual stage first, immediately for me, it was very clear. This gentleman is a colleague. He's a former client of mine. He's a dear friend. And he's someone who was quite unique. And these are the five things you need to know about our lovely speaker, Wolfgang Neumann, which I can tell he's getting nervous because he knows I tend to play around with the intros. So the boring stuff first. Until 2017, he was the president and CEO of Radisson Hospitality. He is still the non-executive director of Radisson Hotel Group until today. He is a champion of sustainable tourism development through his leadership of the ITP, the International Tourism Partnership. He's the chairman of the Hotel School of The Hague, so it's fantastic to have our international opening, opening up of the hospitality community proven by your being here, and we're grateful for him. But this is the fun part. This lovely gentleman, as you will see, absolutely, he can wear his business suit and stand on a stage professionally and exude all he needs to professionally, but he's actually an overgrown child. He is one of the most genuinely excited people about the world in which he sees as his playground. He is wanting to make a meaningful difference. He has the ability to make an impact wherever he goes, simply from his point of view, but he scares me. Because whenever he says that he's going to take a holiday that's just going to be a little hike, he usually ends up sending photographs from the top of Kilimanjaro. So I feel terribly lazy at the concept of how we define holidays. But Wolfgang Neumann, we are so excited to have you here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the confidence you've had in making this work and ultimately in being with us as our first guest speaker. For anyone whose screens just shrank, just do a full gallery view or a full view screen in the corner. So Wolfgang, I have to ask you, this is our pilot program. This is our launch. This is our baby. It's a new concept. Again, it's for students, with students. Why did you say yes to the invitation? First of all, thank you, Damien. Thank you, Annette, for having me part of the of show. I think it's a brilliant initiative. I think in this time when I listened to you, you did a great scene setter, and I think the word uncertainty must have come up more than 20 times. These are uncertain times for us, everyone as human beings, as individuals, uh, as business leaders. It's uncertain for us as society. All of us have all kinds of questions and we don't have all the answers. So it's important in this time, I think, that we share, that we challenge each other, that we support each other. And I think that's what the two of you are doing. And it's great that EHL takes the initiative with you and that the Hague Hotel School can partner with uh, the other great hotel school in Europe. Thank you. I have a question for you. You said it yourself as well, that there is, there's just so much change. There's just such a need to learn and to share and understand. How do you, as a leader with enormous experience, and ultimately you're a hotelier in your DNA, how do you make sense of what is the future of hospitality? What are you looking at to process as signs, indicators, confidence levels around, oh goodness, what is going to happen next? I think you did a great scene set now. We, we know that there are so many dimensions which we just cannot control. Uh, as Churchill said, I think we're at the end of the beginning and I think we need to be patient. There is so much yet that we need to learn and understand about this virus. I think before we don't have the vaccine, business cannot probably resume in the normal way as it used to. So we're gonna have to be prepared for the long haul. And in the meantime, focus and ask ourselves some key questions. Uh, as uncertain as we all are, I think that uh, this virus has also some good. And I think ultimately we as a society, we as business, we as individuals can, and I believe, optimist as I am, will come out stronger. I think there's some learning to be done I think already before the pandemic, we knew that we had to get off the treadmill and do a few things differently, mm. with a different pace, with a different focus. And I think now we are forced to do that. And I'm hopeful that we will learn from that. Well, okay, if I can follow up a little bit, you said um, we need to ask ourselves some questions. So I'd be curious to know if, if you were still running Radisson or any other, any other hotel company, 
what, what do you think would be some of those key questions you would be asking yourself very specifically? What would you be having your top team think about in order to understand the company's role in the future and the, and the future of the industry? Specific, uh, specific uh, question. Damien, I think, you know, the event is one thing. The response is the other. Because we, we cannot undo this uh, virus. It's there, it's global, it's invisible. But the key is how we respond to it. And what do we make out of this adversity? And I think that's the fundamental critical question. Do we crumble? Do we stay uh, locked up and don't do anything? Let this happen to us? Or are we taking this advantage, adversity and turn it into something? There's a great book written by Paul Stoltz, an American who talked about the adversity advantage, i.e. turning an, advent, an adversity into something positive, into turning it something which ultimately gives us energy. So it's not about just from our perspective avoiding the, the virus because we can't. It, it's not about coping with it or it's, we need to not only manage it, we need to really turn it into something which gives us energy and harness it. And I think that's the key as a leader is about what mindset do I take? Me as an individual, us as a team, us as a business, society as a whole. If I can ask you one more follow-up, Anita. Have you seen any examples? I mean, I gave the Marriott and Airbnb example before. Have you seen any other examples in our industry where you say, oh, I, I like what that company is doing. That makes sense for them to already be doing that. Or have we not yet seen what companies are really going to do about this? Uh, I mean, there are so many examples. And I think you, you just shared two uh, hotel companies, small and large, are becoming a force for good. Because I think ultimately, we have a role to play beyond the bottom line. We have a role to play beyond the environment. Sustainability, to me, embraces the local community. And I think hotel companies are showing uh, in so many varied examples, be it turning hotels into... Um, hospitals, uh, helping the staff, helping in hospitals, um, the food uh, supply to care workers. It's, it's great to see how we are making a difference. And I think that's encouraging. So that's the short term response. It's very, very positive. Yeah. I think you, you make a great point there and I just want to, and it's part of the reason why when Demi and I first started talking about this idea four weeks ago, it was exactly that. How do we not waste this time? And that's where I, as an employer, will sit back and if someone approaches me for a job, once the doors are open, I'm going to ask them, how did you use the 100 days? What did you learn? What did you do? What did you contribute? Or did you sit back and wait until we were told, go again? I think that's really important. I have a question for you, though, and this is something I struggle with, whether it's hotels, airlines, airports, restaurants, whatever it is. Hospitality is a very tactile industry. We're very, we're texture based, we're human. We are, we're, it's about contact. It's about connection between human beings. And I, again, I'm, I'm struggling. I, I, I'm formulating the question as I'm thinking it through. On one hand, we want to maintain that human connection. And yet we know now because of this invisible crisis, people are afraid of each other, not because of each other, but because of this invisible thing that might be lingering. How do we as an industry keep the textural, the touch, the sensual, and yet we still need to now bring in all of this sterilization testing. Where do we find somewhere in that spectrum that's a comfortable zone that people still want to have a holiday? Yeah, you're absolutely right. But I believe that our business, the travel and tourism business, the hotel industry in particular, is very well positioned for that. Because what is our business all about? It's about people, it's about human interactions. You said it's about dreaming, it's about discovering, about being together, about creating what I call memorable experiences. Now, I think we're going to have to do this slightly differently. We're going to have to prepare now. The, the short-term response that hotel companies need to focus on is really focus on the employees and the team because it's, it's all about rebuilding the team. What is it about? It's about giving them confidence to, to come back to work, but also confidence to deal with the customer. So it's all about the building of the workforce. Then it's about building the, the supply chain. And, and then it's about the operational adaptations in terms of what do we have to do? You know, probably breakfast buffets or lunch buffets will be a thing of the past that will have to be redefined. 
And then we have to engage with the customer where we also have to build confidence. Hey, it's okay to come back to our restaurant, to our hotel. We have done the necessary steps because hygiene, safety and security will become much more important in the future. But they're also, it's about giving customers, our guests confidence in the brand, in the way how we handle it. And I think we're going to have to redefine these human interactions that you allude to. Hmm. But the core of it, it remains positive. And that's why I'm so utterly convinced with all the, if I may call it the doom statistics that we have heard and seen now in your introduction. Yes, it is extremely challenging for all of us. But my appeal, particular to all out of you, your students, who either are uh, getting ready to embrace this industry, or are thinking about it. This is a brilliant industry who is well positioned. Why? Because I think our society will look at human interactions also in a different, in a different way. I think there's some revaluing going on. And I think there our industry will be very well positioned to do just that. A little bit less I, a lot more we in a different way at a different pace. I'm a happy child. Over to you, Damien, for the last question. Well, okay, our last question is a little bit different. Is I want you to imagine your nephew or niece is watching this show and they're about to graduate hotel school or they've just graduated and maybe they've lost their, their job, been furloughed. What, if we, if we can, three specific pieces of advice would you give them? And, and, and by that, I mean concrete things you would do now to best position yourself if you were this young nephew or niece, so that when, as Anita said, 100 days are up, they are well positioned to get a, get a job, get their job back, advance in, in their career, um, as opposed to those who maybe haven't taken advantage of those 100 days. What would, what would be the three so things my, you would My do? number one, Damien, is adapt a positive mindset. It's all about here, in between our two uh, years, be positive. You know, what is, this, what is within you is much bigger than what is in your way. Eric Weinmeier, a blind athlete, said that, and I believe that. So the, the, the positive mindset, number one. Number two, ask yourself, what is your pandemic story? What is your personal COVID story? What have I done in this time? What have I learned? What difference have I made? What, where have I helped? What, what did I use this time for, which was given to us uh, basically as a gift because it's about caring and it's about, you know, making a difference. Um, and I think you call this show RISE, right? And, and in the spirit of, of, of acronym, I would say, remember that this industry, RI, is special, S, and E, really embrace it. I think hospitality, we need to go back to the core of hospitality and then I think a student going into this industry rise to the challenge. Remember, it's a fantastic industry. It's all about human actions. It's about positive experiences and we can do this and stay positive. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I think it's good advice and I, and I do think everyone uh, will may struggle with staying positive, but if they can remember that that's half the battle, I think, and uh, while everybody else around you is losing that faith, if you can maintain it, I think it, it'll, it is a great way for people to position themselves going forward. Wolfgang, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Hopefully we can get you back uh, in the near future when things look a little different and get your perspective on what's working and what's not. So thank you again. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you. What we want to do um, besides just say to Anita, great guest and, uh, and, and good advice. And, and I hope um, people can take that to heart and uh, compare his views in future week with when we bring in other hotel executives, but also executives from airlines, cruises, travel and tourism, governments, et cetera. I think it'll be nice for them to be able to compare not only the advice, but their perspectives. That's, that leads us into our next segment, which is um, our inbox. And we want to now try to answer or discuss some of the questions that you have posed through the Q&A function throughout the episode. I'm, I, I'm assuming that there are some. And um, Sarah, do we have any questions? Yes, we have lots of questions. Oh, great. Let's, can you give us one? Okay, so Anonymous asks, looking at uh, looking up a lot of unemployment levels increasing due to the cost efficiency during uh, COVID-19, how do we survive in the hospitality industry since 
the fight of graduates will be tougher with all the professionals out there that will also be looking for jobs. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the key questions, right? So if I just to rephrase it, you're entering the industry and before you just had to compete with other people entering the industry for a job, largely, but now you also are gonna to have to compete with everybody who's already been in the industry, who's been laid off and they're looking for a job as well. Uh, I mean, again, I don't necessarily have answers. I think you need to think just like firms, how do I differentiate myself so that I bring something unique that these people don't? It can't be experienced necessarily because they've been working longer. Maybe I did something going back to these hundred days. Maybe I've worked on my education. I did some charity work. I contributed to the recovery of um, people that are ill. I helped hospitals. I took some free online classes. There are, there are many out there, many firms and companies are offering things, especially to hospitality workers. Maybe I've gone now and done something different over the next few months to learn a new skill. Um, I don't really have more advice than that, but that idea of differentiating and building up your experience so that you can differentiate yourself from, from your colleagues and, and peers, I think that's key. Nita? I'm gonna add a different perspective on that. And I think it also goes back to how Demi and I view the world differently. I don't think it's the students and the grads that need to be nervous. I think it's the people who lost their jobs during this who need to be nervous, quite honestly, because there is no going back. It's not as if we're going to get through the end of the COVID-19 life cycle and suddenly we go back to the world of hospitality. Our world has changed. The value of travel and tourism has changed and the values of travelers has changed exactly what Wolfgang was saying. So I would argue that it's the new wave of the future of leadership that's going to be in a very strong position. Exactly, Demi, and as you said, the whole, as, as Wolfgang put it, what is your COVID-19 story? How did you adjust to these 100 days simply using technology? We knew that it was always, we, we, in our industry, we'd been talking for five, 10 years about the millennials. And I must say, I loathe that term because it's such a generalization and it takes out the human component of the fact that there are people that were grown in a, that were born in a certain window of time. But the future of travel and tourism is not the past. And it is the future leaders who are going to be looked to, to shape, okay, so what, in addition to what you were wanting, how do you know we need to adjust to the new world of travel, tourism, and hospitality? We know the role of technology is now invasive. We know it's been life-saving because it's been spirit-saving. I think this is a really interesting time. I would be, and I genuinely would say, I would be no more nervous if I were someone with years and years of experience in hospitality who had been at risk of being let go or let go, competing with the future of hospitality, knowing that the past and its direct relevance has changed profoundly. That's, that's my point of view. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna add a little something building on what you said real quick. I think another advantage that you might have if you're still in school or just graduating is that, and it builds a little bit what Anita said, you are not, the world is gonna be different. The industry is gonna be different. We're gonna do things differently. You are not coming into it with a set mindset of someone who's been in the industry and working. You may be able to position yourself as, hey, I'm willing to be, to be flexible. I see that things are changing. And for this, I would tell you, you need to question some of the things you have learned in school because some of those things are gonna change. Revenue management may change, marketing may change, brand standards may change. Doesn't mean that your education hasn't been worthwhile, but question some of those things and start to think, how do I take what I've learned and think differently about that given that everything in the world is going to be different, especially our industry. So try to position yourself as that more open and more ready to change just like we have to change. Um, Sarah, can we get another question? Yes. Uh, tourism is taking a backlash from COVID-19 right now from a sustainability perspective. However, COVID is in a way helping. Um, nature being one of, the, uh, one of tourism's main resources, it could be a long-term positive impact. How do you, th do you expect tourism to pick up in terms of behavior? Do you think people will pick up the same old behavior as soon as the economy permits it, or will tourism change? People will fly less and try more local tourism after seeing the positive impacts on nature. 
It's a great question. And Damien, if I may, I'm going to jump into this. And for everyone that's been really good in putting in questions, we're hoping some of our answers will actually connect to some of the questions if we don't actually get to you. This is an important one. And I've always believed that one of the benefits of challenging times like this, sustainability has never only been about the environment. There are officially four levels of it. It's economic sustainability, social sustainability, cultural sustainability, and environmental sustainability. I also believe there's spiritual sustainability. You don't want tourism for tourism's sake. What's happening with COVID-19 is it's demonstrating sustainability is now understood to be about how do we now open up our world again to ensure not only that our skies stay blue, but that it means we can also have blue skies along with economic growth, along with cultural protection, along with social development. And just how the word community has now become human rather than digital. People care about their neighbors now. So to answer that question, Mother Nature is, is she, she's smart. She's given us the almighty of grounding and intervention and saying for all of the goodness that travel and tourism brought our world and how people and places around the world were able to become economically active, personally empowered, whether it's women, small businesses, nothing has been more powerful in economically developing sustainably the world than our industry. How do we now do that, recognizing that the environmental component is critical? It cannot be an either or. We cannot be having the protection of blue skies and the development of that as a, as a mandate for the world when we know it's causing poverty because people are out of jobs not longer, no longer being in tourism. I do believe issues like over-tourism will be a thing in the past because this is forcing us to recognize our momentum rate was too quick and we were losing not just our management of tourism, but our, man our manners as travelers. So I think this is a brilliant time. And again, going back to how did we use the 100 days? This is our time not to simply rebound. We need to re-engineer re in a wider sustainable tourism development definition that is economic, social, cultural, environmental, and spiritual. That's where to me the opportunity comes. Because like I said earlier, the value of tourism has changed and the values of tourists has changed. Damien? Well, let me, let me ask you a question, Anita. Do you think firms that are obviously are struggling financially and who have maybe invested in sustainable practices because they were doing well and could divert some money to these measures, which oftentimes can be expensive to implement, even if long-term they have a good return, are they gonna cut back on these measures? And are we gonna see a, a, a decrease in sustainable practices from hospitality and tourism companies in the medium term? It's a great question. And I'm hoping that it's not about, and I, my belief, no, they won't. I think they're going to accelerate it. A, because now they as human beings, not just leaders, have recognized what matters. They also know global travelers are going to be wanting this now. They're going to be demanding it. It's a bit like the whole thing yeah. about plastic straws and people cutting back on plastic straws. It's not about a plastic straw, it becomes a bamboo straw, it becomes a pasta straw. Why do I need a straw? So if anything, they're gonna look at their models to say, what can we actually eliminate from our old model that allows us to focus on a more sustainable model in our operations, but also in our experience? Because to me, my belief going forward is that the hardware is going to become less important than the software. Service culture is going to become much more important because the value of travelers is increased. Health and safety is now at, for, at the forefront. So my protection of you of, as my guest is more important to you, hopefully, than what you see around when you come and visit for dinner. That's the difference there. Okay. I'm going to say we should take one more question just because I know we're a little behind. But if Anita, if it's okay with you, I'm going to suggest that w once we're done with the show, maybe we can stay on and anybody who wants, we can go through some more of the questions. So if they ask the question and we didn't get to it, we'll do that in a little while when, we're, when we finish the show. And if people who don't want to stay on for that, obviously they don't have to stay on at all. So let's take one more question, Sarah, something a little different. Um, okay, this one's hotel development related. So Sophie asks, what do you think will happen in hotel development in the next coming years? As development is often planned years in advance, will we see a delayed impact? 
Yeah, so my, my quick answer when you say, what will we see? I think we will see nothing. Um, I think- Same. <laughs> I think you're not gonna see, people are gonna be afraid. Uh, um, the other day in the STR webinar, they mentioned that there are more hotel rooms being built now than ever before in history. So that means if all those rooms continue to be built and that we finish that construction, we're gonna be flooded with a lot more supply of rooms while demand is at an all time low. Would you invest in a new project now? I mean, there, there could be some exceptions, right? Um, there are certain segments of the industry, obviously the economy segment is gonna outperform luxury in terms of occupancy for the near future, as I think it has been over the last few weeks. So Sophie, I, I, I think you're not gonna see a lot of development. I think you're not gonna see a lot of jobs in development right now. I think people are going to abandon projects that are in the early planning stages. Um, if, if they don't have to build those right now. And we're going to allow some time to pass until things start to pick up. The good news is after the financial crisis 10 years ago, where uh, so, you know, we had a huge buildup in supply before it, it did rebound relatively quickly after and we saw another boom over the last couple of years. So long term, everything's fine. Short term, I think we're, we're not going to see a lot of development. I have a shadow on, on Sophie's question. Why is hotel development about rooms? Because I would agree with you if that's in high density tourist business areas, but there are a lot of hotel developments that are taking place outside of those bubbles. There's still an opportunity there because it's not just about the rooms. I'm not saying it, we're, not, we're gonna see zero. I'm just gonna say we're gonna see 98% less rooms being built next year than, than, than we would have seen otherwise. Sure, there's some destinations that still have a potential. There may be, maybe there's a new product out there that we haven't thought about yet and somebody comes up with a new brand idea that's going to take off because of what's happening. So we will see some exceptions, but I don't think it's a growth sector for the short term. And um, just so we know, two weeks from now, uh, we're gonna have a, a big focus on real estate and development with our executives. Won't be the whole show, but if you're interested in that, development in the real estate and the expansion side of the industry, make sure to be here in two weeks. Okay, a little plug. Let's, let's move on to our last um, segment of the day. Um, Anita, you wanna introduce it? I can indeed. And this, this one must say is quite fun because this is where I, I, get to, I get to banter with Damien and he gets a little bit nervous. The idea being, we wanted to look at, okay, so from each of our perspectives, what are we concerned about based on what we've heard today, what we know, what we're hearing from your questions, and what are we confident about? Now, unsurprisingly, Demian is gonna take on the concerns and I'm gonna feed you my confidences. So I ask you all to sit back, enjoy Demian's concerns, join me in putting on my rose colored glasses. Demian, over to you. Okay. My first concern is the, the fact that we are entering a two meter economy. Distance is everything right now. We went low density. We're closing borders. We are social distancing. There are space requirements being implemented in restaurants and other public areas. So we have to keep a distance from each other. And I'm concerned about the impact that will have on the industry. We're an industry about being close to one another, about restaurants that only have margins and can make profit if they can uh, pack as many people as possible inside. Hotels need a high occupancy level to, to generate return, which means a lot of people close to each other. And I think not only is the legal aspect of maintaining a distance going to be harmful to the industry, but I think our psychological reactions to this and being afraid of being close to people and children being told, stay away from strangers or stay away from even people you know, it will have an implication. And so are we going to be stuck only traveling in the five to 10 you know, blocks around our house and avoiding high density areas? So that's my main concern. It's, it's a great concern and it's a valid concern because all of us are actually living that right now. And it's a question of, again, when do we want to start traveling? Your concern is my confidence for this. By people being kept away, they're feeling and they're seeing how much they need to be together. And this is where I feel that as the doors open, exactly as you say, no one's going to go running out. There's going to be a nervousness about safety of closeness of contact. And this is why we have great confidence in the fact that domestic tourism is going to start first, purely because as people expand their comfort zones, but also because of this crisis, governments have learned that travel and tourism and hospitality is critical to supply chains. So if people travel at home and they basically holiday here, they're actually helping rebuild the country. But this is where I, I do feel though that our industry was growing 
with a lot of technology coming into it and also the need for touch. There's, there's a huggability factor that we're missing now and we need that back. It kills me when I go to the grocery store to get fresh milk. People don't have eye contact anymore. And even if you're wearing a mask, you can still feel if someone's smiling. Can't we just keep smiling? So if anything, the starvation of contact is increasing the hunger to be back together. And that's why I'm confident that once the doors open, we'll stay away a little bit because of medical concerns, but as those concerns lift and we know that we're a more virus safe society, the huggability will kick in again. Okay. I'm not even going to comment on the word huggability. We can talk about that later. That's a you know, contact, and that's my second, uh, my second concern. I'm concerned that we are experiencing, as you said, a contactless or contact light world right now. Right? We are shopping online more than ever before. It's up 80% in Italy. My 83-year-old mother is now shopping online and can't believe she wasn't doing this for the last 10 years. My kids are being homeschooled and they're, and they're great, great school, so they're online with their teachers and their peers. And my nine-year-old doesn't want to go back to school. He, he prefers this. And we're all working from home. We're having this, this lesson or this, this discussion on, online or I'm giving classes online. We're getting used to not having contact with people. And so as the world maybe needs to or desire, decides to move towards less contact, this has to have a huge impact on an industry that is all about contact. Restaurants, you're in contact with the waiter. Hotels, you're in contact with the guests. You're in contact with other guests, let alone cruises and airlines. And so I'm concerned about the contact light economy, you know, and its impact on our industry. It's a great point. Um, I must say, I'm, I'm sure your mother's going to be delighted that you told the world her age. So <laughs> I'll leave you fine. dealing with that. <laughs> But I think this is very reminiscent of the conversation we've had in our industry about artificial intelligence and virtual reality, that will it actually cost us because travelers can now put on their glasses and they're there. If anything, it's shown that as much as the technology has allowed us to increase contact now when we've had no access, it's brilliant because it's widened supply chains, it's widened retail opportunities, very importantly, it's widened education. People who normally couldn't have access to schools and education because of money, because of geography, because of whatever it is, are now able to learn free online. All they need to do is connect. So this contact list has actually widened the opportunity for more people to get more opportunities to products, to skills, to people, to contacts. We have the world watching right now. That is amazing. And that's a huge blessing. But I'm sure for everyone watching, they really want to be able to see you after this and give you a good post COVID-19 hug. So all of that, all of that is there. I think importantly, what's really what needs to be looked at is once the doors open up, how can we leverage this contactless to accelerate the efficiencies that we need to keep hospitality strong without starving the emotional elements that are critical for exactly as Wolfgang said, that human interaction that is the heart and the heartbeat of hospitality. That's my confidence. All right. I mean, I see your point. I'm obviously more skeptical. Um, my third concern is a bit simpler and quicker. Um, I just don't see people spending money on leisure and services and recreation and travel in the short to medium term like, like we need them to. You know, after the financial crisis, there was a huge or a significant increase in what people spent their money on. And it changed to much more services and leisure and travel and away from material goods. People already had large flat screen TVs. They stopped needing to buy bigger ones or change their cars as often. And they had a, re, you know, a rethinking about what was important after that crisis. And it was, was great for our industry. I think it's going to go the opposite way now. I think we're going to say, I can't be out there. I'm afraid. I don't want to travel. I don't trust that country's government or hospitals. And I, I'm concerned. And I'm going to be at home more. I was just stuck at home for 100 days or whatever it is. I'm going to spend my money on the bigger TV, on the new lawn furniture, on redoing my house. And we're going to return to cocooning and, and, and decrease our exploration of the outside world, which clearly is not good for our industry. I hear you, but my confidence is simply this. This time is creating a new thinking around a savings culture. And it's not stopping spending, 
It's just being more thoughtful about spending in tandem to savings. I think that's a really good coming out of it, an element coming out of it, because there's no age attached to that. We all behave differently financially. And if this time teaches us all to save a little bit, to protect our future, but also spend in a way that allows us to appreciate how we're spending in our future, that's a good thing. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, clearly we, we, we don't agree on everything. I think we agree on the issues and we have different perspectives. And, and for me, that goes back to this idea of uncertainty, right? There, there, is, there is no consensus. Everybody, we're making up our thoughts as we go along. We're facing new data. We're facing new situations and we're trying to, to make sense of them. And we will make sense differently just as companies will and industries will and, and countries will. And I think we need to, I don't want to say embrace the uncertainty, but we need to accept that it's there and we have disagreements and, um, and, and that, 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 that disagreement is a large reason for the uncertainty. And I think over time, when we start to see what works and what doesn't, we will resolve that a little bit. I will say, I hope you're right. I would love to be wrong and all the things that you said happen. So hopefully, uh, once again, I will be wrong as my kids would say. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's almost time for us to say goodbye, Anita. Indeed it is. And I think I think what's really important about what you were saying, Damien, is the fact that as much as there might be different perspectives, diff diff potential disagreements, the important thing is we use this time to, to understand and not judge and understand different people's perspectives on how things are. But one thing we do agree on is the fact that this is for the students, the grads, the future leaders of our industry itself. So we have our next week coming up itself. I'll let Damien introduce that in terms of why we focused on this subject. So we've been hearing a lot of people use the idea of the new normal, but I don't think there is a new normal. I think there's the next normal and then there's gonna be the next normal after that until we settle on something. So what we wanna do is look at the, the near term um, issues in the industry. What's gonna be happening over the next few months and, and, and six months if you want, and how does that impact you, students and graduates and maybe people um, rethinking their careers. And we're gonna bring on a few specialists that really can give some very concrete advice and understanding of the employment situation and the career situation out there, always within the context of the, the hospitality industry and the impact and the changes that it's going on. And like I said, the week after will be a real estate focus and we'll keep you posted on what we're doing each week. Um, and, and what we do really think is important is that you do stay in touch with us. You have our email address, you have a, a Twitter account. You can also post any more questions now because we really want to make this as, as relevant and meaning for you as possible. Brilliant. And to that point, I think what is important is that this is for you. So keep us posted. If there's certain issues you want us to discuss, certain people you want to explore opinions with, please let us know. We're incredibly grateful that you've held with us all this time. Thank you. We've gone a little bit longer than we anticipated, but we're hoping you found that it was a good investment of your time. Um, a very warm thanks again from my side to the team at very much at EHL, especially with Demian and Sarah and to everyone who's been involved. We're going to introduce you in a moment to the team itself, but we look forward to seeing you next week. Please, please, please don't forget to make sure that you're registered for next week so you can click on and join us. Thank you so much. Take care, stay safe, keep your hands clean, and we'll see you next week.